Welcome back. This is part two of our personal finance talk. And in the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to try to convince you to start saving now. Let's see why that's important. <clears throat> All right. The power of time. Time is on your side. So the question of when should you start saving? Yesterday, the power of time cannot be overstated. Uh, what this really comes down to is the idea of compound growth. So compound growth means that you're earning interest and then that interest is added to the base amount you started with. So here we've got, let's say, again, we said we put $2,600, 4% of that $65,000 income we put $2,600 into you, uh, an investment account. So as you earn a little bit of interest on that, that money is stacked on top. Your balance goes up. And now you're earning interest on this new amount. That interest is also put in. And now you're earning interest on this new higher balance. That interest gets put in. So what happens is your balance increases over time and it increases at an increasingly faster rate because let's say you're making 7%, 7 percent seven percent of 2600 that gets added on now it's seven percent of that new total and then seven percent of that new total on and on so simple interest means that you get basically a fixed interest rate on this initial balance and that's it so one example of that is, let's say that you bought a CD, you bought a thousand dollar CD certificate of deposit uh, at your bank. Let's say that it's uh, going to last for three years and you're going to earn 5%. So you put a thousand dollars to get that CD. And then when it matures, you get a thousand fifty dollars. So that's your 5%. Well, let's say you put that thousand dollars into a retirement account. And let's say that that retirement account has a like 5% uh, annual growth you do that for three years, you've got $1,161. So you've made, instead of 50 bucks, you've made $160, $161 to be precise. So that's 16% growth. And then again, the longer that sits, the higher it goes. So if you're making contributions <clears throat> that are earning about 6% interest, it takes about 10 years for the interest that you're earning each year. It takes about 10 years for that interest to actually be more than what you had initially invested. So you're earning more than what you're putting in each year. Uh, there's another idea about doubling. This is called kind of the rule of 72. Um, but total balance will double approximately every seven years. If you're in that kind of six to seven percent interest rate. So again, we see here the straight line growth for simple interest. So our blue line is what we put in initially. And then over time, this simple interest grows like that. Compound interest, when we're earning on a continually higher balance, you can see that that gets to be logarithmic there. All right, let's talk about the power of doubling. <clears throat> Wait, not doubling, the power of doubling. So this is something that most of us heard for the first time in probably middle school. But let's look at it uh, again today and then see how it applies to us. So on the 1st of April, you get a penny and that's gonna double each day. So on day number two, you get two pennies. Day number three, four, the fourth day, you get eight pennies, 16, 32 and on. How much are you gonna have when you get to the end of the month, April 30th? And what if somebody said, you know, instead of that, instead of doubling your penny and letting you keep uh, whatever you have at the end, what if I just give you cash, 500 bucks, thousand bucks, would you rather just take the cash and be done with it? Well, as you may remember from school, the power of doubling means that you're going to end up with a fair bit of money at the end of 30 days. So the end of that first week, we had 64 cents, but at the end of the second week, we've got $81. Not bad for starting off with a penny. By the end of the third week, we've now got $10,000. Wow, really growing. So what's it going to be by the end of the month, day 30? $5.3 million. And look at this final growth. The end of that third week, we have 10,000. 
Five days later, we had 330,000. Five days later, 5.3 million. So the end part of this is where that growth really happens. Between, let's pick day 10 and day 15, we went from $5 to 163. Respectable. From day 15 to day 20, we went from 160 bucks to 5,200. Day 20 to day 25, up to 167,000. So the amount of growth that we have is accelerating. <laughs> Too bad it wasn't March. Too bad we didn't have 31 days. If this was March, on the 31st of March, we'd have, what, 10.6 million. So, what about Joe? Poor Joe. He was out of town. He was on vacation for the first five days of the month. So he didn't get that first penny until day number six. So he missed out on the first five days. How does that impact his bottom line? Well, when he gets to the 30th of April, he's got $167,000. So... 167,000 is nothing to sneeze at, but would you rather have that or to have started a little bit earlier and have 5.3 million? He misses out tremendously because he got started a bit later. Let's see how that applies to us. So we want to put money aside now, even if it's a small amount, 50 bucks out of each paycheck, $100 a month, anything. We're going to look at a one-time deposit of $5,000. We're going to say it grows at 8%. It turns into a million dollars by the time you're 70. So when you're born, grandma gives you $5,000 to put into an account. By the time you're 70, that's turned into a million dollars. And again, here's that logarithmic growth. You can see how much it grows between 60 and 70 is this much. So that's a lot of growth in 10 years. Down here, from year 10 to year 20, it grows just that much. So not every 10 years are created the same. The more 10 year segments you have in this case, you're making more and more and more for each given year. All right, let's look at another example. So Jill is gonna put aside $1,000 a month from the time she's 20 to when she's 30. So for 10 years. So a total of $120,000. What does that turn into when she retires? 4.4 million when she's 70 years old. Jack is also going to do $1,000 a month, but he, he gets a later start. He doesn't start when he's 20. He starts when he's 30, but he does it for 40 years, all the way up until he retires at age 70. So he puts in a total of 480,000. What does he have at retirement? 3.5 million. So even though Jill put in a quarter as much money and for a quarter fewer years she ends up with a million dollars more she started earlier and even though she put in much less total she ends up with a lot more let's look at another one of those so jill's going to put in a thousand dollars a month from 20 to 65 so she's got 45 years worth of contributions, a thousand bucks a month. She puts in a little over half a million dollars, 540,000 overall. By the time she gets to age 70, she has $11.7 .7 million. Jack is also going to do a thousand bucks a month, but instead of starting at 20, he starts at 30. And he still does for 45 years. What does he have at 75? 5.2 million. This is incorrect. That should be 75 years old for her. So they both contributed for 45 years. They're both touching, uh, taking that money out, not touching it until they're 75 years old. But again, she has more time to let it grow. So even though their contributions were the same, because hers had 10 more years of growth, same number of years of contributions, but 10 more years of growth. She ends up with twice as much. So starting early, even if you only contribute for 10 years, starting early with a small amount turns into a huge amount of money. 
let's see what that looks like uh, in another another example. Here's Gene. Gene's going to put away a thousand dollars a year for a year, and she's 23, and then she does 2,000, and then by the time she's 25, she's ramped it up to 3,000 a year until she's 32, and then she stops. No more contributions after that. By the time she gets to retirement age, 67, she's got 1.1 million. Here's Carl, poor Carl. He misses out on these earlier years. He doesn't start saving until he's 33, right when Gene stops. But he does 3000 a month, and he does that all the way up until retirement. So whereas she's only contributed 27000 to her account, he's contributed 100000 to his. So four times as much. But how much does he end up with? 820000 When you start saving, it's so much more important than how much you actually invest. And I would also add to that how long it grows is another huge consideration. So again, looking here at Jean, she contributed 27,000, but she started earlier. She ends up with 1.1 million. Carl contributed a total of 105,000, but he started later. He only ends up with 120,000, uh, 820, yeah. All right, so let's leave behind those examples. I think that paints the picture of starting early, even with small amounts has a big, uh, big, big, big impact. Let's talk about just some financial priorities overall. And this comes from the White Coat Investor. So, some things to do. Make sure you've got disability insurance. Most employers will offer some, but if you lose the ability to perform your job duties, you wanna make sure that you have some money coming in uh, either for retraining, re-education, go back and do a different type of residency, whatever, having disability insurance, very important. Make sure that you've got an updated will. We're going to talk about life insurance in a little bit, but having some life insurance on hand is reasonable. You want to have a little bit of a cash emergency fund, and then we're going to look at loans, student loans. Um, we're going to talk about an extreme solution, pay them off as fast as you can and why that is not a good thing to do. You want to refinance, you want to consolidate into direct loans and then see if you're going to be eligible for the public service loan forgiveness. Let's talk about that over here. PSLF, public service loan forgiveness. If you work full time for an eligible employer, a government, a government agency, a not-for-profit uh, and there are places online you can look up employers and see if they are eligible for the PSLF program. Uh, with federal direct loan, which this can also be consolidations of federal family education loans or Perkin loans, but all of these loans have to be consolidated into a direct consolidation loan. So work for an eligible employer, consolidate loans into a direct consolidation loan, and then when you've made 120 payments, so 10 years worth of monthly payments, um, and even sometime when loans are in forbearance or deferment, that can count towards the 120 uh, total payments. Also, if you have breaks in your employment history, so let's say that you work for uh, a nonprofit for three years, and then you go and spend some time doing some other like private sector work, and then you come back and work for a different nonprofit for seven years, there's your 10 years. So it is cumulative across your career. So when you meet these uh, requirements, you get forgiveness of the remaining loan balance. So huge, huge, powerful tool. And another reason that, again, we don't really want to do this extreme uh, option of paying off loans as quickly as humanly possible. So refinance, consolidate loans, and see if you're eligible for public service loan forgiveness. Uh, you want to contribute money at least enough to get the employer match in your 401 or 403. You want to pay down high interest debt, anything over kind of 6 to 7% interest, which credit cards, some car loans, some possibly student loans. You want to contribute to an HSA. Remember we talked about that. That's the triple, the three-time tax advantage. You want to max out... 401, 403, 
which again we said is 23,000 a year and then some catch up after you're 50. The 457 that also has that 23,000 a year limit. Um, look at doing Roth conversions, backdoor Roth, we talked about that. And then maybe contributing a bit more to student loans, making sure you have a quote real emergency fund. Most people would say that you wanna have somewhere between six to 12 months of cash on hand. Uh, now that doesn't mean cash sitting in your bank account because savings accounts, checking accounts have notoriously bad interest rates. So that money is sitting there not actually earning you money, but you can do something like a money market. Uh, you can do some other things that will have like up to 5% um, growth. And then saving for a house down payment, looking at things you can do for tax advantage uh, with your mortgage. Um, and then also, of course, physician, low interest or 0% down uh, loans, which we're not going to get into. That's outside of today's talk. But uh, important to think about kind of overall financial picture and how do you, you know, with the money that you've got, how do you prioritize? How do you get the most bang for that buck in uh, savings and debt reduction? So th this is a way, again, this is from White Code Investor, uh, tax efficient investing uh, waterfall. So you kind of, you know, fill up this bucket and then it overflows to the next and so on downward. So again, you absolutely want to do your employer sponsored retirement plan, your 401, your 403, or your 457, at least enough to get that employer match. Because if they're willing to give you say 6% of your salary, as long as you're contributing say 6% yourself, if you don't contribute your six, you're leaving this money, free money on the table, which we really can't afford to do. Uh, pay down high interest debt, save into the HSA, max out any tax uh, advantage, tax deferred retirement plan, um, work that backdoor Roth, save into taxable brokerage accounts, where these are things that you can set up on your own. And again, I would consider doing kind of that three fund portfolio, that bogglehead approach, keep it very simple. Or if you want to scratch that, you can even, in something that you set up on your own, you can just pick a target date fund. Uh, look at alternative investments and then pay down low interest things, which consolidated student loans, mortgages, although maybe not in this day and age, uh, can be some of this low debt stuff that you don't necessarily want to pay down quickly. Um, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So this is the idea of, oh my goodness, I'm going to continue to live like a resident my first few years as an attending. I'm going to save all my money. I'm going to pay off my student loans as quickly as I can. I get it. I hate debt. I hate having debt. It feels like it's hanging over my head. I want to get out from under it. However, let's look at what that math works out to be. So we're going to say Steph here, her student loans are $1,000 a month, but she says, you know, I'm going to pay more. I'm going to overpay by a thousand. So I'm going to put 2000 a month to student loans. I'm going to pay those off quickly and then I'm going to wait to invest until I've gotten rid of my student loans. So five years later, she has her student loans paid off. She starts putting that 2000 a month into savings and she's paid a total of 10,000 in interest on those student loans. All right, let's look over here at Steve. What Steve does is he says, well, my student loans are a thousand a month. That's what I'm going to pay. I have this another thousand that I'm going to invest. It takes him 10 years to pay off his student loans. He pays 21,000 in interest, so he definitely pays more interest than uh, Steph does. But at the end of 10 years of investing, she's been able to put in 152,000. He's been able to put in 187. If they let that grow for another 25 years, she's got 2.2 million, he's got 2.7. So even though it's tempting to pay off student loans quickly, continue to live like a resident, save all that money, the math of it does not work out unless you have high interest rate loans. That's more akin to paying off a credit card, but we'll come to that in a minute. Let's look at another example of this. This is, oh, I wanna, I wanna get this house payment reduced. I wanna have my house paid off in 15 years instead of 30. So how does that work? Let's say that, again, Steph has her mortgage that she wants to pay down. So she's gonna pay for 22 years, a little bit extra, 2,500 bucks a month, 
towards the mortgage. And it's going to take her eight years to get that paid off. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Once she gets that paid off over the course of the next eight years, so we're looking at kind of an overall 30-year time frame, uh, then she starts putting that 2500 a month into index funds. When all is said and done, when she goes to retire, that's turned into 365000 But here's Steve. Steve says, you know, my mortgage is 2000 a month. That's all I'm going to pay. If I've got an extra 500 I'm going to invest that starting right now. And so then what does that turn into? $1.1 million. So again, extra money should go into investments if what you're paying off student loans mortgage is a relatively low interest rate if you can make more interest on your investment so let's say that you can make you know seven to eight percent on your investment and your loan is at you know four percent five percent then it's worth it to put money into the investment if we're comparing that to say a credit card oh let's do that here's Bob oh actually no his name's John can't call him by the wrong name um, so I'm <laughs> gonna go to write it again <laughs> here's John he's got a thousand dollars in credit card debt <clears throat> and he's got 50 extra dollars a month that he can use for whatever He's got a 15% interest rate on his credit card. Uh, let's be more realistic. It's probably closer to 24%. Um, and he can make 1% uh, interest on his savings. So over the course of two years, he can save $150 by using this extra 50 to pay off the high interest credit card. So this is a scenario where when you've got that high interest, you want to pay that off first before you start investing it. All right. We've been talking a lot about savings, talking about retirement a bit. So let's talk about retirement. How much money do you actually need to retire? Will your savings last long enough throughout the life of your retirement until you kick the bucket? Well, let's start with a very sobering and sad fact. One in three Americans has zero dollars saved for retirement none huh we know that the cost of a comfortable retirement depends on where you live if you want to be living on the beach in Hawaii that's going to be quite a bit more than if you've got a you know 20 acre spread in the middle of Wyoming if you want let's say $120,000 a year salary so to speak income when you retire so that means that you need 10 grand a month you need to have three million in retirement savings. Uh, there's all sorts of formulas and calculations. How much do you spend? What's your current salary? How much should you be saving? Down here, Fidelity and T. Rowe Price have their recommendations. They say that by the time you're 40 years old, you should have three times your salary saved in retirement. So by the time you're 40, if you're making $300,000 a year when you're 40, you should have 900,000 in your uh, retirement account uh t Rowe price is a little bit um, more lenient there they say only two times but then once you get to be 60 so really zeroing in on a retirement age mid 60s uh eight to nine times your salary so 2.4 2.5 2.6 million How much money do you need to retire? Everybody's got an opinion, but let's look at some facts. So the real question is, how much will you be spending in retirement? And then also, how long will you be spending it? So how long are you going to live? How many years of retirement do you have to fund? Well, our finances change quite a bit when we retire, obviously likely you're not going to have many of the big ticket items that you have throughout your earning years so maybe your house is paid off maybe your cars are paid off maybe you make sure that your house and cars are paid off before you retire uh child care expenses probably not maybe the kids are done with college so you've got all those educational expenses out of the way you've paid off all your student loans 
Retirement spending tends to be more kind of month to month maintenance expenses. However, you also have a lot more free time in retirement. So fun spending, travel, hobbies, that spending can increase quite a bit. You've also got increased healthcare spending as well. One thing we're not going to talk about at all today is the cost of assisted living for yourself uh, and the availability of insurance for different assisted living environments. That's obviously a big part of you know, retirement into, you know, end of life care. Uh, but that's beyond the scope of what we're discussing today. So how long will savings last? That is the question. Do you have enough? Can you afford to retire? So let's say that you've got 2.5 million in your retirement accounts. You want to take out $10,000 a month, 120 a year. If you do that, you've got a 23% chance that you're going to run out of money in 30 years. So this is a, uh, a program called FireCalc. You can find this online. And again, there are a million online um, formulas and guides and calculators and opinions and uh, so much. So if the question is, if I retire today, what's the stock market going to be doing for the next 30 years? Well, one way to not even have to ask that question is to not have your money in the stock market but then you're not going to be earning as much on your money. So it's going to run out faster. So if you have your money invested, you want it to be in relatively low risk sorts of things. Couple that with the fact that no one can predict what the stock market's going to do over the next 30 years. Again, the overall trend in the past has been that it, you know, goes up over time, but individual, you know, variations in that. So while we can't predict the next 30 years, we could look back and say, well, what's it done over the previous 30? Maybe that's an indication of the next 30. Well, instead of just looking back over one 30 year period into the past, from now to 30 years ago, what if we go back 10 years and say, all right, what about in 2014, if you had retired then, what did the 30 years before that look like? So that's, that's what gives us this graph here on the, uh, the bottom right. Uh, this is taking the last 123 years worth of stock market, US market information and saying, all right, over all those time periods, what do, what do we have? What does that snapshot look like? And what it does is that it says, all right, let's look at that 123 possible scenarios. 29 times you ran out of money. So the balance at the end of your retirement ranged anywhere, depending on what, you know, what year you started, you ended up anywhere from minus 4 million to positive 12 million. And again, this is on a 2.5 million starting balance. So 29 times you ran out of money. So, you know, 76% of the time you're successful, 24, 0.6 of the time, 23.6 of the time, you ran out. So this is a very busy graph. It's a lot of information, but the idea is trying to predict what is going to work. How much can you afford to take out each year? In general, 4% of your balance per year is thought to be a relatively safe uh, withdrawal rate because if you do that, you have a 95% chance of success of not running out of money. So only a 5% chance that you'd run out of money before the end of that 30 years. So if you retire at 60, running out of money by the time you're 90. If you look at the stock market itself, the big question is, what, what will it do? What will the U.S. economy do? Well, we also talked about how exposed are your investments to the volatility of the market. Um, you know, if you've got all of your investment in Amazon shares, well, you better hope that Amazon does really well so that your money continues to grow. If you have all of your money in government bonds, you're not going to be earning a lot, but you're probably not going to lose anything. Depending because those can be tied to inflation and interest rates. But anyway, um, individual stocks can be very volatile. Uh, is Microsoft going to go bankrupt? Is Coca-Cola going to go out of business? Is, you know, ExxonMobil going to disappear? Yeah, probably not. But still, 
individual stocks are more volatile. Mutual funds that are made up of big groupings of individual stocks, less volatile. Index funds that follow kind of overall market uh, for the country, less volatile. Target date funds, we talked about target date funds. These are specifically balanced to mitigate risk. Bonds, anything that's guaranteed, treasury bills or CDs uh, have guaranteed returns. Those returns tend to be lower, but you have quite a bit lower risk. If you look at the US stock market from 2000 to 2023, a quarter of the time, 24%, there was either zero growth or negative growth. So when you think about retirement, there's no guarantee that your investments are going to perform well. Again, in the long run, they will. But over any shorter period of time, years go up and down. This is something that's a little bit more esoteric, but I wanted to uh, discuss it very briefly. Um, how long will savings last? Uh, there's something called the sequence of return risk. So this is the risk posed by down markets, negative returns uh, on your uh, investments, your retirement accounts, uh, negative returns that happen late in your earning years or earlier in your, uh, your retirement years. So we're gonna look at two examples here. Both folks are starting with a million dollars in their retirement savings. Um, we're gonna say that they're taking out 4.5%, so $45,000 per year is how much they're withdrawing. So Miss A has three good years of growth in her uh, funds in the market, followed by a bad year. And that cycle repeats itself, three good, one bad. Mr. B, the dark blue line here, he has one bad year, one year that's kind of okay, and then a better year, and then a good year. And then that cycle repeats itself. One bad, one kind of neutral, and then two that are okay. Mr. B runs out of money in 25 years. Miss A runs out in 40 years. So even though they're starting with the exact same amount, they're both experiencing good and bad years. But within this first cycle, the fact that she's got three good years is earning money before a bad year, where he's having a bad year and he's taking out 45000 a year. He has an okay year, but he takes out 45000 a year. Well, now when he gets to finally having a good year, he's got... 90,000 less after those first two years. 90,000 because he's just making his withdrawals to pay his uh, expenses in retirement. So <clears throat> there is a, a risk to your money based on just when you happen to retire and what happens to be going on with those investments within the first several years. One way to avoid this is as you're getting close to retirement, build up a little bit of cash. Start retirement with enough cash so not specifically in your savings account, but readily available money that isn't tied to the volatility of the market. Have enough of that so that you can not take money out in down years. So if he had a million dollars, but then let's say that he also had 45,000 in the bank. Well, this first year, he can be using his 45,000 in cash. And as the market's going down, he's not withdrawing any money. He can wait for it to start to go up and then withdraw 45 and build that cash reserve back up as well. So <clears throat> let's look again at how long does money last? So let's say that uh, I'm gonna retire in eight years and I wanna see if I've got money enough to spend 20 years in retirement. So I'll retire at 60 and will I have enough to make it to 80? Let's say that I've got 2 million in my retirement accounts, it's going to continue to earn, grow at 7%, and we're going to say inflation is about 3% a year. If I want to take out 110000 a year, so we've got our beginning balance here of $2 million, and then how much we withdraw, and they actually build this up. You can see that the amount withdrawn increases each year because they're accounting for inflation, taking out a, a bit more each year. By the time I get down to 20 years, zero. I've depleted all of my retirement savings. 
So apparently taking out 110,000 a year is a little bit too much. Let's back that down a little bit. What if I take out 96,000 a year? All of these starting conditions are the same. Start off with my 2 million, take out 96,000 a year. I end up in 20 years, I still have a million dollars. So just that reduction from 110 down to 96, so taking out what, 14,000 less a year. So a little over a thousand a month less instead of running out of money, I still have half of my starting balance. If we back it down even a little bit more to 82,000 a year, we start off here with 2 million and what we end up with down here, 2 million. So if we reduce the amount we're taking out, if we get that down low enough and if our investments are actually making a bit of money, we can end up 20 years down the road with more than what we started with if what we're taking out each year is less than how much it's earning. So how much you take out each year is very important. Uh, we also can't forget that Social Security may play a role in retirement. I'm hoping it'll play a role in mine. Uh, will it still be there? Who knows? It'll probably be different than it looks now. But we can at least talk about how it works. Um, so anyone with taxable income pays into Social Security via those Social Security taxes. And as we said, it's 6.2% on the first 168,000 you earn. And, and again, this number, this limit goes up every year. Okay. Your personal Social Security information is available online. Go to socialsecurity.gov, you put in your information and this is what pops up. So this is my employment history every year that I've had taxable income going back to 1986 when I was a sophomore in high school. I had my first job at Village and Pizza and I made $1,300. So I made 1,300, this is actual earnings over here. And so 1,300 was taxed for Social Security. Graduated high school in 1988. I've got some earnings here. Then went to college, had a couple years where I didn't make any money in college. Graduated, took a couple years off from there, you can see. Um, graduated from med school in 2000 and then actually started to make some money in residency. Not a lot, 39, 40,000. And then here graduated residency in 2004, got my first job. My first uh, contract was for 179,000 for that first year. Um, and that, that's when I, for the first time ever started to meet that income limit. Back then the limit was $90,000. So I made 186, but only the first 90 was taxed. And then again, each year you can see this goes up and up and up. So in 2023, the limit was 160,000. Now it's 168,000. It's really gone up kind of sharply in the last couple of years from 147, 160, 168. So my actual social security benefit, and again, this is on the website when you put your information in, if I retire at age 62, I get 2,500 a month. If I wait until I'm 67, that's what they consider the full retirement age, I'll get 3,800 a month. And if I delay retirement a few more years, if I wait until I'm 70, I get 4,800 a month. So if you think about what your monthly expenses might be, I mean, for me, although that's still, uh, you know, what, 15 years away, um, Hopefully that number will continue to go up, but 3,500, 4,000, 4,800 a month, that could actually pay a pretty significant percentage of my, my expenses. So something to be, uh, to be mindful of. One little fun note down here in 1986, that first year that I worked sophomore in high school, minimum wage was raised that year. It went from $2 and 75 cents to $3 and five cents an hour. So raking it in. All right, let's talk very briefly about life insurance. Uh, who needs it and what's available? Do not think of life insurance as winning the lottery. Uh, this isn't the, oh, you know, her husband died and she had a $10 million life insurance policy she got. It's, it's not about some huge cash in. People who need life insurance are people who currently have someone, say a spouse, or have people who in the future, kids that are growing up, uh, people that are planning, who 
who are counting on your income being available. Uh, you can be paying for funeral expenses. You can pay for daily living expenses. People that have ongoing mortgage, daily, monthly, long-term education, college expenses. So if your family is counting on your income being there to pay for the, the mortgage so they don't end up out on the street paying for college because, you know, all of that savings is, you know, potentially going to be ongoing throughout, you know, elementary, junior high, high school. Those, those are the people that need life insurance. So if you are single, you live alone, you don't have anybody who's depending on your income other than you, you really don't need much life insurance, maybe a little bit to pay for funeral expenses or whatever. Um, a lot of employers will provide some basic amount of life insurance, either as part of your compensation plan or for a small fee. Uh, my employer, uh, Wellspan, has a $500,000 life insurance policy that they provide, and then I pay for an additional $500,000. Um, at this point, I have enough in you know, retirement accounts and savings that when my family would be able to pay for funeral expenses and be able to keep paying my mortgage until they sold my house and that sort of thing. Um, but I still have those just because I signed up for them when I uh, first came to this area. Um, there are two, very, very simplistically, two types of life insurance. Uh, one is called term life and the other is called whole life. Term life is pretty straightforward. You pick a certain term anywhere from 10 to 30 years. There are a few that go up to 40 years. And you say, all right, I'm going to buy, say, a 30-year term, because right now I'm 30, and I want this to cover me from when I'm 30 to 60 years old. So you get a 30-year term. It costs you whatever the monthly premium is. And then at the end of the 30 years, if you're still alive, the whole thing expires. So the policy expires if you don't collect by the end of the term. You can renew a policy. So let's say that you start off when you're 30 and say, well, my kids are young. I'm just going to get a 10 year policy to kind of cover them until they're out of the house. Well, let's say you get to that uh, 10 years. So now you're 40 years old and you say, well, uh, yeah, they've got, you know, some, some college expenses still, or they're starting families of their own. And I want to be able to provide a little bit for them. So you could do another 10 year policy to cover up until you're 50. So do another 10 years. However, this premium is going to be quite a bit higher than that initial policy because insuring somebody who's 30 is different than insuring somebody who's 40. So you can renew a policy, but usually at a higher premium when you're older. But again, I would only do it if it's still needed. Whole life is just a completely different sort of thing. Uh, it's more expensive, but you kind of lock in a monthly premium up front. One thing that's different about whole life insurance is that it does have a cash value. So it's kind of like a savings account in that regard. You can take money out of it. You can borrow money against it. It also earns interest and there are aspects of this that can be tax deferred. So in that regard, it can be a bit like a retirement plan uh, and it never expires. There's no time limit for it. So as long as you keep paying the premium, the plan stays in place. Uh, this can have a role in estate planning and inheritance because, again, this money has cash value and has those kind of tax benefit implications. Um, it can play a role in passing money on as well, which the particulars of that are, are beyond what we're going to talk about here. So, if anything, what I would recommend would be... Um, a term life policy if you've got a spouse or young kids people who re really are relying on your income and then you know once those financial needs or expectations uh, are diminished then you really don't need it or don't need much after that all right getting close to wrapping things up let's talk about financial planners a bit so we've talked about a lot of information a lot of concepts um, people are very intimidated. I am still intimidated by uh, personal finance and you know so many options and what's the right thing to do and I don't want to screw it up and a lot of people get uh, a bit of deer in the headlights and and think well I just I don't want to make any mistakes so I just won't do anything. Um, absolutely the wrong thing to do. 
there's a lot you can do on your own. There are a lot of resources to have a very simple approach. As I said, all you have to do to really be off on the right foot is use your employer provided retirement, your 401, your 403. Just put money in that, if nothing else. Get their match, do your max contribution up to that 23,000 a year. And if you do nothing else but do that for the life of your career, you're going to be sitting better than the vast, vast, vast majority of Americans. If you take one step beyond that and look at doing an HSA or doing a 457, the deferred compensation, that will put you into the, str the stratosphere of savings. Uh, and again, you don't need any financial knowledge. You don't need to know anything about the stock market and how that works. I certainly don't. Um, you don't need to, to, to pick individual companies that you hope do well. Try to find that meme stock that's going to, you know, to the moon. Um, so being able to do quite a bit of it yourself, when is the right time to use a financial planner? And this is something I came across in a couple of areas. If you're building your very, very first financial plan, sure, maybe not a bad idea to sit down and say, you know, I finished residency, now I've got this income, I want to start off with some good habits and do some things right, so let's talk about a plan. Another option is if you need a second opinion, you know, if you say, ah, I've been going along, I think I'm okay, but I just want to kind of do a spot check and see if you have any recommendations, what should I, uh, you know, change up. Or if you don't have the self-control to stay the course when the market goes down. If you see that your retirement account balance is tanking and you're going to panic sell everything and lose a crap ton of money, and maybe then having somebody to help manage your finances is the right thing to do because either they'll take that, that option of you selling things and losing money or making bad investments, kind of take that off the table or at least, you know, talk you through it and, and maybe talk you out of it. And then at some point, hopefully we'll all be in a, a financial situation that's just it's so much money and and we're leaving things to the next generation and it just gets a, all a bit complicated you know you've got a business you've got some rental properties you have a trust that you're establishing for the the grandkids generational wealth whatever anything that gets that complex having a professional way in on it is is very reasonable uh, i look at that like doing taxes you know i i do taxes myself because i'm a w2 employee it's fairly straightforward and I've got, you know, investments and some dividends and boom, 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 and I can do that pretty easily. When your tax picture gets quite a bit more complicated, that's the time to use a CPA. When your financial picture gets a bit complicated, that's the time to use financial planners. When it comes to the overall heading of financial planner, what's out there? Oh, there's so much. And these people have different training, they have different certifications, they have different experiences. They have different responsibilities to you, uh, legally speaking. So how do you start to wade through all of this? Uh, what I would do is I would find a family member or a friend who uses a financial planner and that they've had a good relationship with and that they trust, they've had good results with, and maybe interview that person. Because picking somebody out of the uh, the phone book, you know, just doing a Google search and throw a, throw a dart and pick a name, uh, that can be kind of tough. Um, when it comes to financial advisors, there's kind of a spectrum of their responsibility to you. Everybody from the more regulated side, so lawyers and CPAs, accountants, all the way down here to unlicensed, uh, you know, financial planners and life coaches. Anybody can start a YouTube channel. Look at me. Uh, anybody can, you know, do a, a, a TikTok on what they invest in and what you should invest in. But you really need to look into what somebody's experience is. And, and then, especially if you're talking about, you know, big dollar amounts, uh, make sure that they have your best interest at heart. Which brings us down here kind of to the, the bottom right. Um, you really want to make sure that you're working with somebody who's a fiduciary. What that means is that they have a legal obligation to act in your best interest. So they're not someone who is going to be looking out for their sales, for their commission, for how much money they're going to make off of their service to you. They have to put your financial interests ahead of everything else. So let's look over here. 
someone who is a fee only advisor. That means that you pay them a fee. It could be a flat fee, it could be hourly, and they give you advice and that's it. There are no commissions, there's no sales. They have a fiduciary standard that they have to live up to. Let's compare that to a fee based. So not only are you paying them some type of fee and they're giving you advice, but they also have these certain products that they would like to sell you. They would like you to buy insurance through them, maybe an annuity. They want to manage your money for you. They've got mutual funds they can hook you up with, but they get paid a commission. They're salesmen. So that doesn't mean that they are necessarily completely evil, but when they're trying to sell you something, when their income is tied to you buying their product, then their advice about which products to buy obviously can be a bit biased. How do financial uh, planners get paid? Um, there are a variety of ways. Some get paid uh, a percentage of all of your assets. So if you've got an account with you know $3 million, they're going to get a percentage of all of those quote assets under management AUM. So it's a fee based on a percentage of your total managed assets. Uh, for example, you have a $500,000 portfolio. The fees that you pay for that could be anywhere from 2,500 to 10,000 a year. They could charge an hourly fee. A two hour consultation could cost you between, you know, kind of 200 to $600. They might have a fixed fee where they say, you know, I'm going to charge you somewhere between one to 3000 and we're going to sit down and go through your plan and come up with suggestions and double check what you're doing. Or if you want somebody to be always available to be able to call and get advice, um, there can be a retainer sort of fee. Um, an annual relationship with the financial planner could be anywhere from, you know, kind of five to $10,000 a year. So a variety of ways that, that you would be billed there. Uh, I would absolutely stick with the, the hourly or fixed fee. Um, once you get to a fairly sizable investment, uh, portfolio, if you're paying a percentage of all of that to them, uh, that, that really can add up quite a bit. So my first question would be, are you a fiduciary? If they're not, then that's it. I'm done. Um, you want to make sure you've got somebody who specializes in high net worth individuals, uh, because you need more than just basics, you know, Hey, do index funds, do 4% withdrawal rate. You know, you can find that stuff on your own. Um, you can get them to, again, kind of spot check and give some advice, but maybe they offer more. Maybe they can help you with trusts for, you know, passing things on estate planning, some tax avoidance, talking about inheritance. Um, those are things that, that can be quite a bit more esoteric and you really want to make sure that you're on the right side of the law with those things. So using somebody who is a professional in that regard can really help. And then also just what's their philosophy? You know, um, do they want to be aggressive? Do they have things that they're trying to sell you themselves? Uh, are they really familiar with like the healthcare sector, with the tech sector, uh, with, you know, energy? Is there one area they specialize in or can they help you just take a very, a very broad approach? And then, as we said, get recommendations and references from family or friends. All right, wrapping things up. There is a lot of, a lot of information online when it comes to personal finance and specifically personal finances for physicians, for residents, for new attendings, for people getting close to retirement, the whole shebang. So up here, the white coat investor, like I said, I had a couple of graphs um, that I had uh, pulled from there. The AMA, the AMC, if you go to their websites, they have financial planning sections. Um, Doximity does. Um, Kevin MD, which is a pretty popular website, uh, physician philosopher. You just a Google search will give you more results than you can shake a stick at. You just have to take it all with a grain of salt. I'm a big fan of Reddit because on Reddit, there's just such a wide variety of finance subreddits. So personal finance, the bogglehead, that three fund approach, um, talking about retirement. Uh, fat fire, uh, fire in general is financial independence and retire early. So that's something that, uh, you know, a lot of us, uh, are, are striving for. Uh, and so how to do that. There's kind of a lot of philosophical talk in here about approaches to investing, but also a lot of very practical advice of, you know, using lawyers, CPAs to, to set you up for kind of maximum, uh, savings. And then obviously lots and lots of books um, that talk about personal finance and how to increase 
your financial knowledge with the minimum of stress, how to make sure that you're doing the right thing. My advice is start early, start now, because we can't go back and start five years ago. Um, and that's it. That's everything we've got. So I hope this is informative. It probably answers some questions, raises a lot more questions. Um, I would suggest for anybody in residency to sit down and talk with some attendings. You know, sit down with an attending that you have a good relationship with and say, hey, can I ask you about, you know, some personal finance? Obviously, contract negotiation is a totally separate thing that, uh, that we spend time talking about with our residents. Um, using, using people who've been through it recently uh, as a source of knowledge, as a bit of a sounding board, is, is incredibly valuable. So thank you very much for uh, your time and attention, and I hope this has been helpful.